Hey folks, today's episode is all about age reversal, biological age reversal. So helping you to get younger as you get older. I don't know about you, but that's always a conversation I want to have. And we talk about the nine hallmarks of aging and we talk about a really impressive person with this impressive person. His name is Chris Mirabile. He is a serial entrepreneur. He is the founder and CEO of Novo Slabs, and he's doing, he's done an amazing job. He himself as a brain tumor survivor, became very interested in health at a very young age and has taken this on as his mission. And I think we're all very lucky that he did. So um, if you're looking to reach out to Chris after this episode, you can find him through novoslabs.com. If you decide that you'd like to buy um, his product, which is an amazing supplement, an amalgamation of 12 powerful anti-aging compounds, all blended into one. Uh, you can use discount code NAT5. And you can also follow Chris on his blog, which is slowmyage.com, where he documents his very own journey of how he's going about slowing down his aging process. So thank you so much for being here. Totally appreciate you guys. If you're looking to reach me, you know where to find me, natalienidham.com or on Instagram, it's at Natalie Nidham, or on Facebook in the Optimizing Superhuman Performance Group. Enjoy. Hey folks, just a quick reminder that all of the information presented in this podcast is for information purposes only. No medical advice, no diagnosing, no treatments suggested here. Before you try anything that you hear about or learn about here, make sure that you check with your medical provider. Welcome to the show, Chris Mirabili. It's a pleasure to meet you and to have you here today. Thank you, Natalie. Likewise. Um, so I got introduced to you by... I guess, I don't know, whoever the person is that reaches out to people and gifts them with this stunningly beautiful, fancy, shiny box of amazing tasting stuff. <laughs> um, and um, which I was really surprised because I have to say, when I looked at the ingredient list, I was somewhat hesitant to pour it into a glass and think that it was going to taste decent. Um, but it tastes amazing. But um, so thank you for that. But I think before we get into that, which is really interesting because when I looked at the ingredient list, I was pretty impressed. Um, I'd like to wind us back to the beginning and talk about what brought Chris to do what you do because looking at your, at least your educational background, it's not necessarily clear that we would place you as the CEO of Novo Slabs, which is a really interesting company. So. Take us back in time, Chris. Tell us how you got here. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. So it's a it's a long, long journey uh, to bring me where I am. Uh, starts when I was twelve. I won't. Don't worry. I won't go year by year. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll skip That's okay. We've got to start somewhere. So twelve yeah. years old. Twelve years old. Uh, in the bookstore, picked up an issue of Men's Health magazine, and that's when I realized that I really wanted to take care of my health. I, I started to exercise, started to watch my diet. At the time, it was at the- 12? The, at 12 <laughs> years old. Amazing. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. My, I, my, uh, I told my dad I wanted to have a gym uh, in the house, and he's like, yeah, well, we're not buying you a gym, but we'll go to Home Depot and buy a steel pipe. And then we hung it with a bicycle chain in the rafters in the basement. And that was my pull-up bar. All right. And so every Rock day did pull-ups, push-ups. <laughs> yeah. Went out for a run, ate what I thought was a healthy diet at the time, which was the commonly prescribed low fat, high protein <laughs> diet. Um, and yeah, no problem. So, uh, but fast forwarding, I, uh, when I was 16 years old, I was diagnosed with a brain tumor. It came from a sudden seizure, uh, or it was discovered after a sudden seizure. I was in New York City, and uh, they gave me a CAT scan, and they found a large mass, larger than a golf ball, uh, on my left temporal lobe. And I needed emergency surgery within a few days of its discovery. And then it was a, uh, a relatively long recovery. I was in my junior year of high school. This is SAT time. Uh, and I was you know, playing sports and uh, suddenly was sidelined. I, I couldn't exercise. It was the first time since I was 12 that I, I went more than a week without exercising. And uh, I started asking myself existential questions about, about life, what, what, what I wanted to get out of life, the beauty of life, finding, finding joy in pain, as crazy as that sounds. Mm -hmm. Like 
because I was able to live to experience the pain and finding yeah. an appreciation in that pain. Uh, things that I, I never would have thought that I would have been contemplating at, at 16 years old. No kidding. Uh, uh, but but that, that experience changed my perspective on so many different aspects of life, partially um, is part of the reason why I'm an entrepreneur t today, because I wanted to kind of chart my own course. But it also planted a seed in my mind uh, related to essentially what has blossomed in, into Novos, which is my perspective on health shifted from one that was really superficial based. I mean, I picked up Men's Health magazine, right? And there's yeah. like, there are male <laughs> models who are in really great shape in that magazine. And six pack uh, and, abs and guns. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and yeah, so for me, admittedly, it was partially that wanting to attract uh, the girls in school and then also wanting to do well in sports. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and setting those types of goals. And those are more superficial goals. At this point, my, my interest in health became more biologically focused. So how do I avoid disease? How do I prevent myself from ever getting another brain tumor or mm -hmm. a, 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 some other form of cancer or cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, dementia, you name it, like all of these things that are typically later on in life. I was asking myself these questions from an early point in my sure. life. Well, it makes sense, right? Because that whole infallibility thing that young people are gifted with for so long kind of got snatched away from you quite early. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so uh, to your question uh, specifically, so I, I went on to study at NYU Stern undergrad. It's a business school. I studied um, finance, economics, and international business. And then I got pulled into the trap of what everyone else at that school does. They go into investment banking and I went into private equity. I, I did it for one year. And I was miserable. Uh, at the time, I was also working on the side on a business idea. It was called mm -hmm. Hotlist, uh, yeah. and and won the NYU business plan competition with the concept, and went on to start that business. And I haven't looked back. So I've been an entrepreneur ever since then, 21, 22 years old. Uh, but all the while, my my deep passion for health uh, never faded. So was always exercising, always. Uh, watching my diet, always trying different supplements and doing research and, and so on. And that continued uh, through my 20s uh, to my late 20s and early 30s. I was telling you before uh, we, we started recording that uh, about 10, 11 years ago, I met Dave Asprey, uh, the founder of Bulletproof. Uh, we had a one hour sit down one on one and he introduced me to the concept of biohacking. And that really intrigued me because of, you know, the, the result oriented approach, the idea mm -hmm. of having a specific goal, whatever that might be maximizing performance, maximizing, um, and that, that could be, you know, mental performance or physical performance and, um, even, even things like, uh, lucidness, right? Like just wanting to be able to experience life more fully. All of these things are goals you can set for yourself as a biohacker, and then you experiment and you have some sort of objective measures to see if you're achieving those goals. And I, I love that. That really suited my mind and how I think. And so I, I began on that journey in terms of going beyond what I had been doing before and now experimenting more with different diet plans, whether it be at first I tried paleo and then the ketogenic diet and then um, ultimately arrived at where I am now, which is more of the longevity style diet that we can talk about if you care to. Yep. Uh, I, I experimented with more than a hundred different supplements. I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, it looks like a GNC in, in my closet in terms of the, all of the different things I've tried. Uh, got different types of technologies to experiment with and, and track it all along. Um, meanwhile, I, I still was starting businesses and they were tech typically technology centric businesses, uh, usually uh, consumer focused as opposed to enterprise businesses. And, uh, uh, but all of my friends would ask me like, why didn't you become a doctor? Or they would ask me for different advice about their situation. And I'm not saying I know more than doctors, I don't, but for their specific situation, if it was something I had researched, I gave them more valuable insights into, the, into what they could do about that than their doctor did. And so they would always ask, like, why aren't you a doctor or, or pursuing that? And so uh, it, it was always something, you know, present in my life since, since a very young age. And um, eventually I had an opportunity where um, I, I had some time to take off for the first time since I was 
15 years old. I started working when I was 15. So in my uh, early 30s, I had an opportunity where I could not work for a little while and think about what I wanted to do next. And I had been researching longevity for a few years. Um, I uh, this, this is actually a serendipitous um, event. I was volunteering at NYU Hospital where my brain tumor was resected. I wanted to give back to the hospital. It was something I promised myself when I was in the hospital and I never did it. So I finally, 16 years later, started to do it. And I was volunteering in the pediatric ward with, with the children who were suffering from things like brain tumors. And on my way out one day, I saw a poster for the mitochondrial summit, which wouldn't catch most people's eyes, but I saw the word mitochondria and I was like, what is this? And uh, I saw a bunch of scientists' names who I recognized, like Dr. David Sabatini at MIT, for example, who studies mTOR and uh, rapamycin and so on. And I said, I have to go to this event. So I went, I was the only non-PhD at this event. And uh, I cornered the scientists after their presentations and asked them questions related to different substances I had been researching on PubMed uh, that could interact with the different mechanisms of aging um, or, or different biopathways that could also impact these mechanisms of aging. And they ultimately, I wanted to see how bullish they were on these studies and on these ingredients. Like, is yeah. this all just hype, you know, mm -hmm. or, or is there something to it? And I think that part of that perspective was shaped by the medical establishment's bias, which is typically, oftentimes you hear medical doctors say, like, if you take supplements, you're creating expensive urine. Like, it's yep. a waste of money. And uh, scientists, on the other hand, aren't taught by the pharmaceutical curriculum, if you will. Mm -hmm. they, they look at their scientific research and they let the experimental evidence tell them what the truth is. And so, in my opinion, they are oftentimes less biased than the medical doctor perspective. Um, and so they were very bullish on these ingredients. And that was enough for me to say, okay, there's an opportunity here with my consumer centric entrepreneur experience, my passion for the space and the amount that I've done this as kind of a, like a side hobby, if you will, throughout my life. Uh, the next thing I need to do is bring the right people to the table. And that is when I started to reach out to world renowned scientists and medical doctors to join the team. And, uh, next thing you know, we started Novos. Wow. That's impressive. I was going to call it your side hustle. <laughs> basically. <laughs> and I think what Dave introduced you to is this whole idea of self-quantification, right? The whole idea of trying different things for yourself first and measuring the effects both um, objectively and subjectively. And I'm guessing that you've used a few different wearables along the way. Um, yeah, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I saved yes. mine for bed now. It's, it's upstairs sleeping. Um, but, um, but so, and you talk a little bit about the diets that you tried along the way. And I'm just curious because, you know, we talk about aging as a process. There's some people who are starting to talk about aging as a disease, which means, you know, if we define aging as a disease, then that means theoretically it's a solvable problem, which, correct, you know. It, it may be to a point, but we can, I mean, we can discuss that or we can leave it for somebody else, but at some degree, there's a process, right? And there's these, these, I think it's um, the last presentation I gave of it was like nine hallmarks of aging. So nine, yes. nine processes that have been defined in the aging process that once we know that they're happening, we can start to target them through different pathways. And so, your supplement, I think, your formula, I don't even want to call it a supplement because it's a formula. It's a lot of different, it's, it's actually the, the nice, the elegant thing about your the, pro, the product you've put to market is it saves us from having 10 different bottles on our shelf. Right, <laughs> Just, 12. I'm sorry, 12. I 12 two. different <laughs> bottles. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I actually uh, a couple months ago, I did a practical exercise, went on Amazon. I, I tried to find supplements in the pr approximate dosages and um, added up the cost and the number of pills, and it was like 16 pills and $160 a month. And so like we're less than half that price and we're one sachet. So from the practicality perspective and even cost savings perspective, yeah, we, we really You're are intent on simpl simplifying people's lives. For yeah. sure. And so in terms of the, so maybe let's do, you, are you comfortable just digging into those nine hallmarks of aging or at least a few of them? Because my gut is, 
you've kind of gone at them, right? This is, yes. you know, a, a formula like the one you've put together is a formula that seeks to cut in at different stages at different points of the cells process, aging process, if it will, as it were. And there's one, um, there's one compound in there in particular, calcium ketoglutarate that got a lot of attention a little while ago. Some people have poo-pooed it because they're like, oh, the study was too small, but I'm curious about your perspective on it and, yeah, sure. So, so uh, first I'll say there are nine hallmarks or mechanisms of aging. These were made famous, popular in the scientific community based on a seminal paper published in Cell. This was maybe around 2015, plus or minus a year or two. Yeah. And, um, and that, that was a meta-analysis of hundreds of other studies that looked into different things causing aging or dysfunctions of aging. And then they categorized these. And they identify these nine different categories, which you're referring to. Uh, some scientists would say that that wasn't complete, that there might be one or two others that are unaccounted for. Sure. And so we as a company uh, have, uh, with the insights of scientists, added a 10th. That 10th one is cross-linking. Okay. So cross-linking, I'm sure you're very aware of this. This is something that can come from, for example, um, excess sugar, right? And glycation can cause cross-linking. And this is something that is also very uh, uh, contributory towards the aging process. So with that said, I'll mention the other other nine. And then yeah. if there are any that you'd like to, to focus on, I'm happy to. So first is mitochondrial dysfunction, mitochondria being the power plants of the cell, as everyone says. And those are not as, as um, you know, efficient, productive, and you have fewer of them as you get older. Mm -hmm. Cellular senescence. Yep. is another so cellular senescence if you imagine a senescent cell is like a zombie cell so uh, it's uh, neither living nor dead oftentimes it's believed that cells turn senescent as part of the body's or the immune system's uh, attempts to arrest a cancerous cell mm -hmm. but once it turns it senescent the body still has a hard time to rid itself of that and the issue with senescent cells is that they produce inflammatory molecules that cause other cells nearby to also become senescent. And yeah. all you need is a few in tissue for that tissue to not function properly. And by extension, the organ to not function properly. Right. Uh, the third. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that, you know, it's interesting on senescent cells because my understanding is we definitely, you know, we get an accumulation of them as we age. Definitely. That becomes, um, it becomes a, a, it becomes a bit of a of a load to bear, right? Because they're they're releasing inflammatory cytokines. They're convincing all their cell friends to also become senescent. Like right. there's all the all this stuff going on, and yet we need senescent cells for signaling to some degree. Like we need some senescent cells, right? You've yeah. So Judith Judith Campisi, who's one of the authorities on senescent cells, has actually done studies where she found that when she rids a mouse of all of the senescent cells, it's actually deleterious. It, it, they end up yeah. in a worse place than when they had some. Uh, but then there are many studies that find that when you remove a lot of senescent cells, the the animal ends up in a much better place. And yeah. so we don't fully understand exactly what the benefits are of senescent cells and having some versus removing all of them and so on. Uh, what I would say about Novo specifically is that uh, we, we have a compound in our formula called Fisetin that mm -hmm. we chose for its um, senolytic-like properties. Yeah. We purposely did not include quercetin, which is a very popular um, senolytic, because of concerns we had with quercetin having a negative impact on healthy tissue. So that's mm -hmm. always an unwanted byproduct of senolytics. Uh, there's, there's a popular uh, combination of desatinib, which is yeah. a, a, a chemo, yeah. Uh, agent with quercetin. Mm -hmm. And my personal concern with that is I, I wouldn't personally do it because it can cause a lot of damage to healthy tissue, including stem cells, which is one of the, t the types of cells you absolutely don't want to touch, right? <laughs> no. Yeah. So now with, with our formula, we haven't published this information yet, but we did a, a study at a third party well-known laboratory in the United Kingdom that uh, looked at human cells and administered Novos the entire cocktail to human cells. And, um, and these were senescent cells. And it found that we have um, what's called a senostatic effect. 
So as opposed to a senolytic effect where you might have unwanted casualties in the process and you might remove too many as, as you were mentioning, uh, we actually reduced the size of the senescent cells by more than 50% and pre prevented them from propagating, from spreading. Huh. Okay. So that, in our opinion, like we want to first be safe and then yeah. offer benefits. And there are some like cowboys out there that are willing to experiment with, with aggressive treatments and good for them. That's perfectly fine if that's what they choose to do. But okay. generally speaking, for what we're selling to the public, we want to make sure we're very safe and that we're also having a positive impact on on the aging process. And so our perspective is that the senostatic effect is superior at this time with the research that we have, the knowledge that we have to a more aggressive senolytic approach. Yeah. So it's a bit more balanced, right? You're looking for that sweet spot. Okay. So yes. cellular senescence. Sorry, yes. I interrupted you. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no problem. Uh, so next is loss of proteostasis. Mm -hmm. So that's number four. Uh, sorry, number three. Yes. So, uh, as, as I have the picture you, in my mind, three, three, three. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so as you, as you age, there are, uh, more proteins that start to accumulate inside of your cells and outside of your cells. And this can interfere with the cell's ability to, to properly function. Uh, by extension, the fourth one is altered intercellular communication. Mm -hmm. So cells need to communicate with each other. It's like a community, right? And they all signal to each other. And so uh, if you have, you know, proteins blocking uh, the, the, uh, the pathways between cells, naturally you will also experience potentially altered intercellular communication. And so um, this could lead to things like inflammation. It can lead to senescent cells, as we were talking about, it can lead to dysfunction of stem cells, um, and, and deleterious substances can, can be produced as a result of cells not communicating, uh, to each other properly. Mm -hmm. uh, number five is genomic instability. So this is something that a lot of people are, are very familiar with, particularly because of the argument, I believe it was in the late seventies, early eighties, uh, about antioxidants. Mm -hmm. So there was always this argument that, you know, get as many antioxidants as possible because that prevents DNA damage and that will make you live forever, right? Like that was the perspective back then. Yeah. And it, it turns out it's not so simple, right? There's nine other reasons why we age and this is only um, a fraction of it. There are other mechanisms of aging that have a much more of an impact than genomic instability does. Not to say that it's not important, but not nearly as important as once thought. And there are other things to reduce the genomic instability beyond antioxidants. In fact, there are some problems potentially with certain types of antioxidants. Sure. So when you say antioxidant, what most people don't realize is that there are different types. There are hormetic antioxidants and then they are like pure form antioxidants. So for example, vitamin E and tocopherols, these are pure forms of antioxidants. Uh, they, they will um, uh, interfere with, they will intercept a inflammatory molecule in your bloodstream. And what's been found is if you get too much of vitamin E, it can actually shorten lifespan. Yeah. Same thing with alpha lipoic acid. It can shorten lifespan if you have too much of it, right? Now, there are other types of antioxidants that are technically, if you're really strict about the definition, not really an antioxidant. They are a, a hormetic molecule that leads the body to increase its own internal antioxidant defenses, right? So um, imagine something like EGCG from green tea. Yeah. Uh, that is going to lead to you producing more internal um, antioxidants, say glutathione or superoxide, superoxide dismutase and so on. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's important to understand the difference between these different types of antioxidants and then the effects that they can have on you. And then also just being very mindful of the idea of hormesis is that a little bit of stress can make you stronger, but that doesn't mean then adding, like piling on all of these hormetic stressors because eventually you're overstressing your body and you are counteracting the positive effects and ending up in a, in a negative place, right? For so sure, for sure. And you need, that's some, something. you need some, you need some ROS in there. You need some react oxygen species. Like you need, you need that, again, to your point, the stress, just wiping out all the ROS is not going to serve you. So. Definitely. Exactly. I think they're important for different processes. Like you, you're doing a heavy workout. You need a little bit of inflammation. You need a bit of that oxidative stress to get the benefits. 
Exactly. I, I like to think of it coming from my technology entrepreneurial background. I like to think of, of molecules as data. And so that ROS, like you're talking about, like that, that is a piece of data that the nervous system can interpret as mm. uh, a call for help, so to speak. Uh, maybe that's from exercising and damaging your muscle tissue. So the body comes back and says, okay, let's make this muscle tissue stronger. If yeah. you completely eliminate that and you live in an ivory castle, you're going to be very fragile. Uh, and as Nassim Taleb would say, you want to be anti-fragile, right? Absolutely. Biologically, especially you want to be anti-fragile. So you need some stressors so that you can withstand the stress when it does come. Cool. All right. We've ta tackled antioxidants and DNA damage, genomic Yes, yes, gen gen yep, exactly. So, so next, number six is epigenetic alterations. Mm -hmm. So this is something that has become very popular because of the work of David Sinclair at Harvard mm -hmm. University. Uh, he wrote the book Lifespan. Yep. He does a lot of work on, uh, on the epigenome and many other scientists do as well. And there's good reason for it. Uh, the epigenome is one of the more promising areas of study in longevity research. Um, some would go as far as saying, I, I'm not personally going this far, but some would go as far as saying that if you can resolve the epigenetic alterations, you could stop or reverse aging. So the idea behind it is that an analogy I like to give is, uh, if your, if your genome is a, are the piano keys, mm -hmm. your epigenome is the player of the piano. And so Although certain genes are crucially important to determine whether you're sick or, or, or whatnot, for the most part, for most of us, um, it's the genetic expression that is more important, whether right. you turn a gene on or off. And that really comes down to lifestyle, right? Or the environment, right? Uh, nature versus nurture. And so different, different lifestyle factors are going to determine which genes are turned on or off and whether it's a symphony that's playing or a child just crashing down on the, on the keys. keys yeah <laughs> right <laughs> and so imagine if um you you can play beethoven when you're 20 years old but as you get older you forget a couple of keys your reflexes aren't as fast and you're missing certain keys and the music is no longer perfect that is kind of analogous to what happens when you age and the problem is that practically speaking certain genes that should be turned on uh, like detoxification genes and repair genes get turned off and ter certain genes that should be turned off, like maybe growth genes, growth pathways, um, that maybe were turned on when you were very young, turn on. And, um, and so your, your, your epigenetic expression is kind of in disarray and, and, and ideally you have it express itself the way it was expressing itself when you were 28 years old, let's say, or mm -hmm. 25, like mm -hmm. when you're in your prime, that is what a lot of scientists are trying to do. And they are, when you're getting more advanced, they're using things called Yamanaka factors, for example, which are yep. named after the researcher uh, named Yamanaka in Japan, who, who got the Nobel prize for his work, where they are able to uh, incite certain um, cells to, to, uh, uh, basically reverse in their age. And, and you have to be careful with how you do it, but uh, Professor Ocampo in Switzerland, the Uni University of Lausanne, who I've personally met with, um, he, he did a, a, a very powerful research study where he was able to administer this to mice, the Yamanaka factors, but do so in, in a pulsed way and uh, um, a certain, certain sequence. And I, I, I can't quote me on, on the exact way he, he administered it, but ultimately the result was that he was able to uh, make the mice essentially younger, like their livers, for example, um, started to regenerate <laughs> and go back to that of a younger state. And so uh, there's a lot of promise there. There's work being done with epigenetics to, and Yamanaka factors to restore vision um, in yeah. people who have lost their vision. Uh, and, and there's a lot of promise for the future uh, for, for uh, interventions to be able to reverse organ aging or overall human organism aging. Mm -hmm. um, all of these mechanisms, including epigenetics, uh, epigenetic alterations, Novos has ingredients that um, address these, right? So for example, epigenetic alterations, uh, we have microdose lithium in, in our formula. Yeah, I noticed uh, so, that. That's an interesting ingredient. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's called microdose because there's only one milligram, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to psychiatric setting for say bipolar disorder might be, 
you know, uh, hundreds of times higher than that. One milligram is roughly speaking how much you would get from a very healthy diet. So for example, well water contains lithium in it. Salmon mm -hmm. contains lithium in it. When you add it all up in a healthy diet out in nature, you would probably get from a half a milligram to two milligrams, sometimes a little bit more. So one milligram is sort of the sweet spot. What we find with lithium is that first of all, it does have positive impacts on the epigenetic programming. Uh, but beyond that, studies have, have found that uh, people that live in regions that have a lot of lithium in their water supply have lower rates of suicide, uh, have lower rates of Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's disease. So, you know, I can't make any claims for FDA reasons about my product uh, yeah. for, for medical things, but it's interesting to see that there are papers that uh, look at lithium in the water supply and, and find these, these results. Uh, we also have magnesium, specifically the malate form, and we, we chose malate. We, we included magnesium malate for the malate, but it's nice to have the magnesium because there's so many benefits from it and so many people are deficient. And the magnesium can have epigenetic positive mm -hmm. effects on, on the epigenome. And terastilbean, which is a more powerful alternative to resveratrol. Resveratrol yeah. has a much shorter half-life um, and it's not absorbed as well. Um, the, the liver removes it much, much more quickly than the terastilbean. Yeah, I used terastilbean, or I was using it until I started taking, I mean, I was reading, I started taking bottles out of my box. <laughs> so. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, so number eight is deregulated nutrient sensing. So mm -hmm. this is what comes into play, like when your metabolism isn't as fast when you get older or your blood glucose control isn't as good. You have higher levels of triglycerides and and cholesterol, right? This This is because your body isn't as able to it's not as tuned into the nutrient signals anymore. And so um, it, it disrupts the cell's ability to produce energy, which also goes hand in hand with the mitochondrial dysfunction. So as you probably know this, all of these things are interconnected, like as Completely. you would imagine, yeah. right? In the human yeah. body, everything kind of works in concert with each other. For sure, uh, which is why you can't address one and think everything else is gonna fall into place. like. It's got to be a multi-pronged approach. Like it just can't be one thing. Exactly. And, and you, you raise a good point, which is that when you look at the longevity industry, it is almost all of the funding goes to biotech. And we're talking billions of dollars in this space. And they are trying to create these super powerful, you know, uh, moonshot uh, interventions that will take many years to actually come to fruition. And there's a high risk that they actually don't work the way intended. But mm -hmm. to your point about trying to impact all of them simultaneously, these interventions are also typically only addressing one, yeah. maybe two of these hallmarks at a time. And in advice from our scientific advisors, people like Dr. George Church at Harvard and MIT, he invented gene sequencing in 1984. Nice. Uh, he's one of our advisors. You know, all these types of people, this caliber of people all agreed that if you're going to have an impact on aging, you really need to address all of them simultaneously. And because of FDA regulations, pharma can't do that. It's only because they, well, first of all, they need to uh, create a drug for a specific medical indication, right? right? right, right they right, can't right. treat aging as a disease. Yeah. If they could treat it as a disease, yeah. then maybe they could focus on these mechanisms, but they can't right now. Yeah. We so have to they hope need they to. Don't. <laughs> right, it's right. Make it harder um, for the rest of us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. It, well, yeah. It would. It would. It would mean more regulation for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Essentially, mm -hmm. which would then make it more difficult for us to to um, innovate. Um, but uh, yeah. So th because they have to focus on a specific medical indication. Um, and they can't combine drugs together. I mean, of course your doctor can combine drugs, but the pharma company isn't taking like five or in our case, 12 different ingredients, putting them together in the formula because they are very reductionistic, right? They yeah. need to start with like one single molecule and test that molecule um, and see what the results are from that. And then the FDA might give approval. Imagine how expensive and difficult it would be if you tried to combine even three molecules. It's a yeah. whole other level. So for sure, for sure. All right. So we got through eight, uh, number, number nine. nine. <laughs> yes. Number nine stem cell exhaustion. Mm. 
Mm. So big one. Everyone, yeah, everyone knows about stem cells by now, right? So stem cells are are the cells that are producing uh, duplicates. They're producing new copies of cells so that your your organs can stay young and perform their function. As you get older, they either become dysfunctional or they die off. Uh, and then this leads to the tissues being less replenished and they're not as maintained. And then of course, organ function declines as well as a result. Uh, and then number 10, as I mentioned earlier, is what we have more recently added is cross-linking. So right. um, sh sugar derived bonds are, are formed between the proteins that make up our tissues. And then this makes them more stiff. So, so this is what's attributed most often to wrinkles. I was going like to say exactly that. Like so we see it on our skin as we age. Yeah. So cross-linking and I would say also like senescent cells, like yeah. a combination of those are, are probably of the, the mechanisms I mentioned. I would venture to say that those two are the most significant factors that lead to skin wrinkling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So those visible signs of aging. Other than the exactly, stupid but but <laughs> you're right, right. But then internally, I mean, just think about like this is epithelial tissue, right? Your skin, but that also applies to your blood vessel lining. That's epithelial tissue as well. So if you see the wrinkles on your face, that's also happening to your arteries and your 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 veins, right? So uh, if if you are doing things that can slow down that process and also add elasticity to to that skin, um, and you're doing it internally. It stands to reason that you may also be doing it to your your cardiovascular system as well. For sure. So, okay, so we've just gone through the ten now hallmarks of aging. First the yes. nine, now the ten, and um, and so you've assembled this team of scientists. Like, how did you go about doing that? That sounds like a gargantuan task. <laughs> right. Like, so, like, where did it all begin? Kind of like, did you identify these hallmarks of aging and then? go around looking for people, different people who specialized in different ones? Or did you go find a bunch of scientists that were would agree to work together, which I think would imagine in and of itself is an achievement, because scientists, by their very nature, disagree with each other, because everybody has their research and belief system. I mean, we hope they collaborate. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But so how did you go about assembling this, this team of superheroes? Because, you know, you keep referring to this, you know, you've got a fairly big team of people who've collaborated and, and come together on this product. Yeah, yeah. So the story starts when I was 12. No, I'm just kidding. It, um, this, <laughs> when I was 12, uh, I met this guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, not going not gonna to bring you through that again. Um, so, so just to clarify for everyone listening, we, we have uh, seven PhDs and MDs. Um, my co-founder being uh, an MD longevity researcher who I'll, I'll mention in a few minutes, uh, and then six PhDs. Um, so how, how did I go about doing it? Uh, I, I think it really came down to a combination of the vision, mm -hmm. um, the unique approach that I was looking to take. I, I wasn't another supplement company. I also wasn't a pharma company that has its limitations and um, is kind of handcuffed in many ways. And so I presented the unique advantages that, that we as a company would have and the unique approach that we would be taking. Um, I also presented a lot of research to reinforce my perspective. Now, the initial formula I had before my co-founder joined is different than what we actually ended up creating for Novos Core. But there were some strong components in there, some of which are in Novos Core now. And um, the research that I was presenting I think the scientists said, okay, like there, there is something to this. This is a novel approach. And when it comes to something like longevity, we need to really make, make some strides on this, right? And mm -hmm. take many different approaches to this problem. Like I would never claim that Novos Core is going to solve aging, right? Like this is a, a concerted effort from, from everyone. And uh, my, my perspective, I, I like to look at Novos as kind of being like the Tylenol or Advil that you have in your cupboard that has a very strong use case, right? But it's not the it's it's, it's not the prescription injectable painkiller that you get mm -hmm. from the doctor, right? So that might be the biotech, the future with DNA editing and manipulation and so on, right? Uh, we are the at home intervention that can actually really make a difference for you, but it's 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 not. I'm not claiming that we're going to you know make a 60 year old 40 again. 
No. At least at least at this point. Yeah. Now there's another, you have another bottle with, I got another bottle. You also provide NMN. Yes. Alongside, right? And you decided, again, you made a conscious decision not to mix it with the other children yes. in the pouch. Um, right. Why did you do that? Because it would have a been so of- easy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of reasons. Throw in um, a bit of NMN. It's only bitty. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so uh, it was a combination of a scientific decision and a commercial decision. Okay. So the scientific decision is that uh, NMN is a is a new kid on the block, so to speak. So if you go to our website and you go to novoslabs.com/how, we describe how we formulate our products. And it includes, uh, it's basically all of the filters that we run different ingredients through before we decide what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And so uh, so I'll I'll, I'll name a few of them. One is the ability to impact the hallmarks of aging. Uh, A second one is ideally they impact multiple hallmarks of aging at once. Yeah. A third is that they extend lifespan in multiple species, which hints at evolutionary conservation of pathways. In other words, if right. if it is extending lifespan in a C. elegon and in a mouse and in a primate, then it's showing that whatever mechanisms it's working through, it is most likely something evolution decided was important and preserved yeah. for humans as well. Right? Yeah, yeah, super important uh, for sure. Uh, number four is reducing the risk of aging related diseases in humans. That which hints that they there's a, uh, they're acting on the underlying aging process. Number five is that they're associated with reduced risk of mortality in humans. Mm-hmm. So, for example, uh, glucosamine. There was a study done with hundreds of thousands, more than a hundred thousand people in the United Kingdom that was looking at different supplements people took, and uh, mortality rates, all-cause mortality rates, and found that glucosamine had a statistically significant and the strongest signal uh, of, of reducing all cause mortality and uh, largely related to cardiovascular events. Interesting. So that's an example. Yeah. Um, so number six is, is recognized as safe by the FDA and other organizations sure. like uh, the European equivalent, EFSA. Number seven, derived from nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, number eight, or it's found in the human body, which by extension is derived from nature, like uh, yeah, yes, uh, we are still part of nature, yeah, <laughs> right, like alpha ketoglutarate, right, or NMN, right. These yeah. are found in the human body. Uh, number nine, very low side effect profile, and yeah. number ten, have been used for many decades without serious side effects. Okay. Now, with all of these different filters, we felt like NMN hasn't been used in humans for many decades. Mm. And um, not that we necessarily need it to be used for many decades. Uh, we don't. I mean, we are selling it. But we wanted more scientific evidence to come out before we put it into our foundational formula. So that means that there is possibility that we do include it in Novo's core sometime in the future. Okay. But we, we will um, we, we take a uh, it, um, iterative approach Right? We have permutations on the formulation. And so this isn't one formulation that will necessarily be the same in a year from now. Maybe That's what it will, I was going to ask you, actually, is do you see this formula evolving? Because the science is always evolving. Like the research is always evolving. Exactly. And yes, so we, we are very open-minded to, to changing formulas. With that said, we, we're not going to just change the formula because there's something again, like cool that everyone's talking about. There needs to be enough research. Also keep in mind, we are funding third party research of our product, uh, both in vitro and in vivo. It's a very expensive process. And so, um, if positive results as we've gotten so far continue to come in, um, it is going to make us that much, um, how do you say it less experimental or we will iterate a little bit less Mm -hmm. um in the sense that you know if if something is really working you you, like why why fix something that's not broken right like if it's working very well maybe it turns into additional product lines additional things that you can take 
in well, a, or maybe you, know, you add another, you know, maybe NMN gets integrated into the formula eventually, and you have another bottle of this other thing that you think might be additive, but you're not so sure. And so you're going to study yes. it. So yes. That's we, kind we of think... a cool modular approach. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And we, we think alike. So what you just said is, is how we're thinking. Um, the second reason I mentioned the commercial reason is because NMN, uh, the price has come down, though. Uh, when we first started, it was prohibitively expensive. Yeah. Um, thousands of dollars per kilogram. It's the still price expensive. is fortunate. It's still expensive. Yeah. And so if we combined it into Novo's core, we would have to charge about $140 a month mm -hmm. uh, for the formula. And we decided that that would be just unattainable, unreachable for more too many people. We as a company, we're a public benefit corporation. Uh, we very much want to improve the health of the public at large. And we do that in many different ways, um, particularly donations, the contents that we we share on our blog. Uh, but also as part of, part of that mindset is that we wanna try to, as much as possible, create formulas that will be as affordable to as many people as possible. Like we could have charged $200 for this formula and, and we would probably get a, you know, a good number of, of higher income customers for it. But we're, our margins are much lower than we could charge. I told you before about the price on Amazon if you were to buy these individually. Mm -hmm. Like there, there's a lot of wiggle room that we have, but we wanna price it as low as possible. And by having two separate products, if someone can't afford Novos Core, which ranges from 79 to $99 a month, depending on which subscription plan you choose. Mm -hmm. uh, they can possibly afford Novos Boost, which is the NMN, which ranges from $33 to $39 per month, depending on the plan you choose. So it could be as low as about a dollar a day for Novos, Novos Boost, or about $250 a day for Novos Core. Yeah, no, that's, um, that's definitely, that's actually a really good price for NMN. It's better than most of what you can find out there. It's, yeah, it's, it's an expensive yeah. supplement. Um, and, and we have, sorry, very quickly, yeah. we have a special special form of NMN that we use. We use a spherical crystal form of NMN. It's a second generation form. So a lot of companies out there are either not using NMN or uh, like they might use uh, niacin, niacinamide. Yeah. Um, but uh, we are not only using pure NMN and we're, we get independent labs, two of them to validate uh, the purity and no contaminants, but we use this micro crystalline spherical form, uh, which reduces the degradation. So it, it is more stable. Um, you know, there's less surface area on the sphere than a typical crystal. Um, and so things like um, humidity, um, or oxygen uh, will will degrade it less, so it can withstand higher temperatures. It can sit out on your countertop. I remember talking to Dave Sinclair when mm -hmm. I was first um, working on on the concept for Novos, and he was telling me about the early days of his research with NMN, and he was saying how it was all so fragile and it would break down so easily. And they had to keep it in the refrigerator and so on. That's not the case with our form of NMN. Nice. That's, that's great to know. So, I mean, so let's talk a little bit about the other stuff, right? I think I would imagine there's a trail of discarded practices, diets, whatever it is that Chris has gone through on his journey. And, and it is interesting to me that, I mean, clearly you're kind of an old person in a young person's body because you came to everything really young, right? right. You got interested in health when you were 12. Most 12 year olds want to, you know, they're mostly focused on the next bag of Doritos they can get their hands on, <laughs> you know, and, you know, and granted you got a cosmic kick in the pants with your diagnosis and your, and the brain tumor, which, you know, would have highlighted to you the fact that, you know, maybe you need to pay attention to your health, but, but still one would almost think that you would launch into cancer research or prevention of cancer. And instead you've gone into this longevity space, which I think is really, it's an interesting take that it's an interesting angle you've, you've gone at it from. And you talk about meeting with Dave and it seems to me from talking to you that you're well aware that Novos Core will be a very important player in people's longevity play, but there's more to it than that. So what else does Chris do to optimize his longevity and well-being? Happy to tell you, if I can first just say that the reason why I'm not focused specifically on oncology, cancer yeah. research, is that um, the perspective 
perspective of, of longevity researchers is that the common denominator across all of these chronic illnesses, including most forms of cancer, um, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, uh, osteoporosis, sarcopenia, uh, macular degeneration, the list goes on. All mm -hmm. of these, the common denominator is aging. And yeah. what is causing the aging are these mechanisms or hallmarks that we discussed. So if you were to cure cancer, for example, you would only extend median lifespan by like two, three years, because if you don't die from cancer, then, you, then the person will die from a heart okay. attack or well, they will I, fall yeah. down the stairs, right? Yeah, although so, in your case, that was a bit different, right? Uh, Pediatric it, cancer is not a, it's not yes, a yes, 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 disease yes, of aging, yes. but fair, yeah. yes, fair, fair point, <laughs> fair point. But now that I'm, you know, my old age in my late thirties, now yeah, I'm starting yeah. to think of all of these other things that can Ripe happen, old age. So. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. So, yeah. So, so the things, the things that I, I, um, have done and have, uh, thrown out, I think was one of your questions, ketogenic diet threw it out. Um, I, I spent years trying to make it work literally years, uh, continuous glucose monitor, use the freestyle Libre for, for multiple years, um, tracking it before that even came out, I was using the finger pricks. Um, first of all, my, my blood glucose was not going down. Um, I think I suspect it was because my cortisol levels went up gluconeogenesis. I needed more glucose cortisol levels went up and, uh, my sleep wasn't as restorative. I, I wasn't sleeping as well. Mm -hmm. Um, hormones were downregulated. I know because my libido vanished, um, and just, I, I just overall wasn't feeling great. Now, with that said, I focused very well. I was really good at like sitting in front of my computer and getting a lot of work done, but for what reason? I think it was because of stress hormones, right? Mm -hmm. I think it was like, it was, it was the adrenaline. It was the cortisol. It was making me like hyper aware, super alert but that's not sustainable. It's not the healthiest thing. And, and, and it's taxing to other aspects of your life. Now, this isn't the case for everyone. Yeah. Um, some people thrive on, on the keto di diet and it, everyone is unique. But the other thing I noticed while on the keto diet was that my cholesterol levels went, they skyrocketed. They, they hit like 230, the total cholesterol. Now, I did have a healthy ratio of HDL to LDL, which is important, uh, but my LDL was also relatively high and, um, Anytime I added carbs back in and reduced my saturated fat intake, which on a keto diet, it's hard not to have a lot of saturated fats from things like coconut and uh, chocolate and so on. Uh, it, it plummets, it, it goes, the cholesterol drops down to like 170 um, in a healthy range. So, so that, that was, that is a concern, right? And, and to the point of like, what is good for you in the long term? Mm -hmm. This is something I didn't mention earlier, but part of the reason I transitioned from biohacking into longevity was that a lot of things that were being recommended in biohacking, I always had the question in the back of my head, is this good for me not only in the short term and these short term goals, but in the long term as well? Um, and and a, a simple example is, is sun exposure. Sun exposure is good for you in the short term, vitamin D production, nitric oxide production. Um, it, it, it produces neurotransmitters that uh, r raise the mood. You feel better from it, right? But you are also causing millions of DNA mutations every minute out in the sun. And of course your body repairs those, but you're now increasing the likelihood for a melanoma 10 years, 20 years down the road. And what I didn't realize at the time was I was dealing with a a biological concept, it's a big word for this simple idea, which is antagonistic pleiotrophy. Mm -hmm. What's good for you today might be bad for you tomorrow. And so what I wanted to find was what is good for me both today and in the long term. And I didn't have a definitive answer on the ketogenic diet. On the Mediterranean diet or on the Novos longevity diet, which is a spin on the Mediterranean diet, it's, it's less wheat and less processed like starches and so on and more mushrooms and, and vegetables and so on. Uh, you can find it on novoslabs.com slash diet, but, uh, Mediterranean diet as an example has tremendous amount of research for, for longevity promoting effects. Right. And so that is something that, that I trust more in for this idea of antagonistic pleiotrophy. Yeah. Another, another thing I was doing that, um, I completely eliminated was I was donating blood for a while, uh, with the thought that reducing 
my iron levels uh, would be good for me, uh, as well as um, um, producing new red blood cells in the process and, and so on. Uh, it was also just a good thing to do, right? Blood donation. So what ended up happening was I, I became borderline anemic and I didn't know it because the blood tests that the um, donation center does um, isn't comprehensive enough. It's just mm. like a basic iron iron level. And then my, my doctors wouldn't give me a full iron panel. And wow. so they're not expecting a, a male to be iron deficient. They really look at only at women for that. And so it just went hidden for a while. And I was feeling fatigued. My, my running performance wasn't what it once was. And I was like, is this really what happens when you're in your 30s? Like, th <laughs> like this doesn't make sense. Uh, and then I found out and I started supplementing with, with iron bisglycinate, uh, and, uh, it took a while, close to a year, but yeah. I got my levels back up and it was like a night and day difference in terms wow. of energy. And, so you, and you would have depleted, yeah, you literally would have depleted your iron stores if it took that long. Your ferritin yeah. Levels yeah. Ferritin levels. Yeah. My yeah. saturation levels were very low. Yep. Yeah. Well, it's really interesting. And, you know, on the Mediterranean diet, I think what's interesting is that there's, many different iterations of it. There's not mm -hmm. one. And it's, um, I mean, I know there's carnivore people out there gnashing their teeth at me. And, you know, I think carnivore can be a really good intervention in certain cases for a certain period of time. But um, I also subscribe to, to including those fibers and plants in the diet, not maybe just for us, but for our microbiome and that the impact that it yeah. has on our health and longevity. See, yeah. D diets, diet, people look at diets like religions, right? Like people get very passionate about, about diets. And my, my response to that is that it, you really have to focus on what, what is the goal of the individual, right? Everyone yeah. has a different goal. And so for me to think that my diet is better than yours because it's better for longevity, isn't taking into account that you're vegan because you are passionate about animal rights, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Or for a religious reason, right? So you first have to understand like, what is the goal of the person who's subscribing to that diet. If, if your goal is to bodybuild and have the biggest muscles ever, the longevity diet isn't the best for it. You wanna activate mTOR as much as possible. You wanna be anabolic as much as possible. Uh, but if you wanna live a very long life, you don't wanna overactivate mTOR. You wanna have periods where it's inactive and you wanna increase AMP kinase as much as possible. And how do you do that? You reduce the amount of animal proteins that you take in. I'm not saying you have to get rid of it completely, mm -hmm. but more animal protein um, will turn on mTOR that much more, which is correlated, strongly correlated with shorter lifespans. It's the reason why rapamycin is so effective at extending lifespans in every single organism it's been studied in. And it's the most effective prescription drug known in the longevity community. It's because it reduces mTOR. Mm -hmm. And so if you're activating it through your diet all the time with a carnivore diet, you might shorten your lifespan, but maybe that's fine for you because you feel much better. It, it, it clears the brain fog and you have a goal of, of, of building muscle or whatever your goals are. I'm not going to judge that, but yeah. it's a different goal than the longevity goal. For sure. And, and I'm, you know, I'm also a big believer in pulsing, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, I want to age well, I want to live a long time and I don't want to end up being a limp noodle in a wheelchair with no muscle right. mass. So finding, I mean, it's, it's always, and I do think that in, in nature and in human health and longevity, it's always about finding the balance and that sweet spot. And sometimes being high in something, sometimes being low, it's a little bit like caloric restriction. I mean, there've been studies after study after study that shows that caloric restriction extends lifespan. The animals end up being miserable, <laughs> but, exactly. but they live longer. They live a long, miserable life. So how can we, in the least miserable fashion, kind of find our way to convincing our bodies that we don't have an excess, that it needs to renew and rejuvenate itself from the inside and create scarcity at times, but then give enough plenty so that we rejuvenate, we restore, and we stay strong. I completely agree. I would say my my weekly routine is is sort of and, and even my like annual routine is modeled around what you're saying. So weekdays I, I intermittent fast sixteen eight 
right? So I, I eat eight hours during the day. I don't eat for the remaining 16. So I eat roughly 11 a.m. until 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. um, and the rest of the, the day, I don't. Um, I'm, I'm pretty low carb throughout um, the, the week, uh, especially because it, I do focus better when I have fewer carbs, though in the evening I have some carbs because I know this, I sleep much better. And mm -hmm. sleep is very important for the restorative effects as well as for longevity. Yeah. Uh, but then when the weekend comes, uh, and I'm probably hypocaloric during the week, slightly, maybe 10% or so. Mm -hmm. When the weekend comes around, I indulge. I have more carbs. I have, I eat, prob I'm probably hypercaloric. I probably have more carbs, sorry, more calories than I, I burn, right? And so I'm going in and out of, of these periods of feast and famine, so to speak, but not literal famine. The literal famine turns takes place once a quarter when I, I take a, a 48 to 72 hour fast. Nice. And that's when like a lot of really positive benefits um, take, take, uh, um, take effect. And so um, I completely agree with you in the sense of, of having, uh, as you said, pulsing, like having periods where you're getting a little bit of excess and, and, um, and then you're eliminating. Now, one, one thing that I have a gripe with is, is the, the, the saying like everything in moderation. Yeah. You and me both. <laughs> because like, what's the definition of moderation today, right? Like moderation today means you go and buy potato chips and chips, Ahoy cookies and you know, like whatever, right? Like that's moderation in today's diet. If you're thinking of moderation in terms of historical, like what did we eat in a really healthy, balanced, um, uh, diet? then sure, if you want to have that molten chocolate lava cake once in a while, yeah. go, go ahead and have it. But today's definition, according to like a Western supermarket definition, is you can't achieve moderation in that context. Um, no, and it doesn't even take into account the hyper palatability of foods that have been mm -hmm. created in labs, right? I think that one of the things that people forget about is that there have been millions of dollars spent and millions of scientists hours spent creating foods that you can't just have one of and and some people on top of that are genetically wired that once they hit a certain taste profile they literally can't stop so you know to your point i think it's very individual some people can be moderate in some ways but many people can't not that everybody has to run around becoming orthorexic and agonizing over every bite of food that crosses their lips. But, you know, everybody finding that balance for themselves, I think is, is the, is probably the better solution for most people and not, and trying not to become religious about your diet. I, I also mm -hmm. believe that we end up needing a different diet at different stages of our lives. We do different things. We have different expectations yep. of our bodies. We have different lifestyles if you're you know tra training for triathlons your nutritional needs are going to be different than if you're hunkering down coming up with the no next novo score formula right that when exactly. you're doing that you're going to need to feed your brain and under feed your body just a little bit so <laughs> so right. those hours of right. sitting are offset kind of thing but but definitely um finding those balances along with the right supplements and whatever the case may be will be the things that will hold the key to hitting that longevity stride as it were. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, to that point, like Novo's core, uh, the ingredients in it, they, they do have some mTOR inhibiting ingredients, some ingredients that increase AMP kinase. And so are kind of like fasting mimicking mm -hmm. molecules that, that can help. Right. So, um, uh, not, not, you know, not, I'm not, I'm not preaching to people who are looking for like a, a cure in a, in a sachet or a cure in a, in a pill. Right. Uh, but in terms of like either maximizing the results you're already getting, or if you aren't super diligent with it, you know, some of the ingredients in our formula can, can help you to, uh, improve, improve. For those sure. Outcomes. So, so on that point, I have a question for you, which I don't know how you're going to like this question, but is would you say that people should take Novos Core all the time, or is it one of these things that you might take for a few months and then take a break and take for a few months and take a break? Like, what are your, you know, again, like I, to be fully transparent, I cycle in and out of my supplements quite a lot. Yeah. There's not very much that I take all the time, like 
hardly anything. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I, I don't have a definitive answer for you on it. Uh, yeah. uh, what I can say is from my own personal experience, I've taken Novos core since it was in the research phase when I was literally mixing it in my parents' basement, um, because I didn't have enough space in my apartment for, all, for these tubs that were being shipped to me. Right. And, um, and we were doing some experiments with, with friends and family to see any side effects and so on. Um, and so that, that's been well more than two years now. And I, I, I take it almost every day. There are some times where I've forgotten, but I've taken it almost every day. Um, what I'll also say, and I should have mentioned this earlier, is that the combination of all of the things that I'm doing in my longevity routine has amounted to a really nice outcome on a biological testing level. Just going to bring that uh, up. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So, so I've, I've done what's called epigenetic tests. So and we mentioned the epigenome before. Well, there are scientists that have uncovered uh, by sequencing or, or looking at specific CPGs, specific, um, specific genes and which ones are methylated or not, so which are turned on or not. Uh, they, can, they can compute your biological age mm -hmm. by looking at many different people, populations, they can compute the age. There are also tests that can compute your pace of aging as well, so the rate at which you're aging each year. And so... Uh, I had this test done uh, back in June, and I was 37.1 uh, years old at the time. And uh, my my results, we we ran it through many different clocks. Uh, we worked directly with the laboratory on this, and uh, my the average results was approximately minus 11 years biologically. So nice. about I think it was 10 and a half years. So I was. 26 and a half years old biologically when I was chronologically 37 years old. Uh, my pace of aging was, um, this is, this is according to the doomed in pace clock. So doomed mm -hmm. in pace was a collaboration between Duke university and Columbia university researchers. It is argued to be the most accurate of all epigenetic clocks at this point. It's also the thing that you will see movement on most from intervention. So if you do the test today and you do the test in six months and you made changes in your life, you're more likely to see the results in this test than any other test out there. Uh, and that was 0.75 years per year. Nice. So aging 25% more slowly. My telomere length was that of a 24 year old. Now telomeres are not nearly as strongly correlated to biological age as once thought yeah. and not as strong as the epigenetic ages, but it is, it is a marker. It's a nice to know marker, especially for DNA damage that we talked about before. Uh, and then my extrinsic epigenetic age, this is your immune system age. It, it's a combination of looking at your epigenome as well as different, um, immune factors like immunoglobulins and so on, uh, came out as 19 and a half years old. Nice. And so sweet. The combination of all of the things that I'm doing somehow is working. Now, how much of it is Novos? I can't say for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hesitant to say this. We haven't published this information, but I did give Novos to a family member in his 70s prior um, and, and gave him epigenetic tests before and after. And his results, I won't give specific numbers. I don't want to you know, get ahead of myself until we have um, a clinical trial and, and far more people. But let's just say it was a very, very significant improvement in epigenetic age for this person. And so I tend to think that my positive results are largely due to the, uh, to the Novos formulations. Nice. That's really nice. Um, I think I know what test you did, but, uh, we, we can leave it out. Uh, I've done the same test. So I think that, uh, I mean, whenever we can have a slower pace of aging, and we know that the landmark is being at least seven years younger than our chronological age. Um, is where we see the real results in terms of a lowered risk of all-cause mortality. Uh, and that's the Horvath clock, right? Yeah, yes. So Steve, Steve Horvath was the, the yeah. researcher who basically invented this. And, Correct. Um, uh, but yeah, and there are multiple other clocks, commercial clocks, academic clocks that are coming out. But we're, we've been keeping our eye on all of them. And we're going to be releasing our own epigenetic clock in, in the months ahead. So, oh, nice. Um, yeah, so right. something you can... You can Take your epigenetic clock, then take Novos for six months or 12 months, and then do the epigenetic clock again and measure your progress. 
Nice. And so, okay. So then you, are you going to be doing your own clinical trial at some point or are you in the midst of it? Sounds like you're doing some research in yeah. that area. Yeah. 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 So, so we've got multiple uh, in vitro studies in human cells. So this okay. is outside of the body and some of them we've got the results for, for example, uh, I mentioned one of them about the um, senescent cells. Yeah. Another study I didn't mention was that we were able to reduce DNA damage by approximately 50% on irradiated human cells. The lab that did the study specializes in longevity. They've done $7 million worth of studies to try to find similar results. And they discouraged us. They said, you're not going to find an effect. We've tested ingredients in your formula. It is the, the synergistic effects, I suppose, nice. of the combination yeah, yeah. that actually they called their CEO to tell them that the results that we got, they were so surprised by them. So we have these in vitro results and then in vivo to your question, a clinical trial, um, that's kicking off. So we, it, it took us a while to get to this point to plan it and get IRB approval. We've gotten approved. So now that's, that, that will start soon. Oh, well, congratulations. That's really exciting. I'm looking forward to hearing, to seeing the results on that. Thank I you. guess it'll Thank you. probably about a year and a half or a year away from that. <laughs> Yeah, it takes take a, while. a while. Even just the recruiting process takes longer than than I, I had expected. Right? Um, it's like a rolling process to recruit people. So, uh, it, yeah, it takes it takes a long time. I'll sign up. I'm game. <laughs> Use me as a <laughs> guinea pig. Um, you're, you're, I think you're a little too healthy, actually. I think you would already be off the charts uh, in a positive way. So, not off the charts, but I'm pretty good. Um, yeah. Okay. So, Mr. Chris, did we leave anything out? Is there anything else, any other stone we need to turn over today or anything else we, you'd like to leave the audience with? I, I think we covered uh, most of everything. The only thing I, I guess I didn't mention was, uh, and I had met, said I would mention was my co-founder, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Chris Verberg. So he's a, a medical doctor. Uh, he is, he wrote a book called the longevity code you can find on Amazon. He also authored our ebook that you can download for free on our website. Uh, he's on the board of the X Prize. Uh, that that's where SpaceX was born out of, and they will have a longevity prize that they'll be officially announcing soon. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a lecturer for Singularity University. He's just a uh, I, I, I compare him to a quantum computer of information when it comes to longevity. So uh, as much or as little as I know about longevity, he he knows far more, and so. Um, if you ever care to dig in deeper into any uh, any of the science and recommendations that he has, I, I think that he would be a great person to to tap into. Yeah, well, guys, let me know if you'd like to hear from Dr. Verberg. We'll invite him on the show. I think I have to go read his book first, though. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like yeah, I've heard of it, so I might even have it. I'm gonna have to look behind me on that. If, book if you don't have it, let okay. me know, and I can I can get a copy to you. Okay, cool. Amazing. So Chris, how can people find you? How do they get their hands on this beautiful supplement? And I will say, I, I kicked off the show with it. I didn't really mean to, but the cool, the, one of the nice things about your supplement is it number one, it's a powder. So it's not swallowing a mint full of pills, which people do on the regular. Um, and it actually tastes really good. You did a great job because masking the taste of vitamins. Yeah. Yeah not so easy, which a I'm sure of, you are painfully aware of. <laughs> yeah. A lot of, a lot of work. We went through many iterations and, and even to this point, like the current version of Novos, each version we came out with had a different flavor profile. And every time we were collecting feedback and improving it, and we're finally very happy with the, the version we have now. So it's orange flavored, zero calories, um, erythritol and a little dash of stevia to sweeten it. Yeah. Um, and a couple of masking agents, everything natural, everything safe. Uh, we were very meticulous about it. Like we, we went as far as saying we don't want citric acid because of its potential effect on the citric acid cycle and counteracting the positive effects of malate. So, and, and, you know, like we were like OCD about this, making sure that every <laughs> single ingredient was perfect for the formula. So um, yeah, it's a drink mix that you just pour into water or you can mix it into a smoothie and, and so yeah, on. Yeah, no, nicely done. Actually, I have a question for you. Does it have to be drunk right away or can you drink it over time? So I, I actually recommend you drink it over time. Um, the, oh, really? The, that makes me feel so much better. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I personally will have like a third or a half of a sachet um, in eight ounces of, of water because it's, it's plenty sweet for me to dilute. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, so I'll have it starting with my first meal, uh, and then throughout the day, uh, the, the, 
longer the, the release, so to speak, of the ingredients, so the longer it's in your bloodstream, especially certain ingredients like cal calcium alpha ketoglutarate, uh, the, the better effects that it can have. So yes, I would recommend that. I would also recommend people, if you have a sensitive stomach, have it with a meal. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, in our earlier iterations of the product, people were having some side effects, presumably from the xylitol. I'm talking very like 3% of customers had some yeah, issues some with xylitol. Yeah, some people don't react well. Yeah, they have gut but, issues with xylitol. But yeah. you don't even have it in there now, do you? We don't have it anymore. We got rid of it for that reason. So we haven't had any reports since this new version came out of stomach discomfort. But if you do have stomach discomfort, just have it with a meal. It will yeah. also slow the, the absorption anyway. For the sure. only thing I would say about um, having it over an extended period of time is that uh, we use a very high quality of, of fisetin in here. Mm -hmm. And... Um, when the fisetin is in water for too long, I find that the taste starts to change. It gets a little funky. That's what so, it is. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I would write, don't, don't mix it in like 24 ounces of water and drink it throughout the day. Okay. Mix it into eight ounces, have it with your meal. And then you can like fold the, the sachet over and kind of seal it, reseal it again. And then when you have another drink later on, have it. Otherwise, it's perfectly fine to have it all in one single drink. But if you want to be a perfectionist about it and, and spread it out, then yeah, just, just Perfect. pour it as you drink it. Yeah. Divide the dose. Okay. I love it. All right. So Chris, where do people find you guys or you? I mean, yeah, good question. <laughs> so, uh, novoslabs.com, um, at Novos Labs on all of the social, social channels. Uh, we're on practically all of them. Uh, and then me personally, I haven't launched it yet, but I will be launching a website that talks a little bit about my self-experimentation and the results that I get from it, uh, that will be slowmyage.com. But mm -hmm. in the meantime, you can follow me on Instagram or Twitter, slowmyage. And then once the website's released, I'll announce it on those social platforms and you can visit that too. Amazing. And guys, we will have a discount code for you. Um, we didn't have it for the show. So although those of you who started with us at the beginning have heard it in the intro and it'll be in the show notes. So Thank you so much, Chris, for being here today. I really appreciate your time. This has been a great conversation. Of course. Thank you, Natalie.